We turn now to the New Testament passages that I have chosen for today. As I let you know in the e-update, uh, I was going to move away from the lectionary passage, and I'll comment more on that in the sermon. But I do want to say something to the young people as we continue to open Scripture and learn about uh, about Jesus, about God, and God's love for us. Uh, I remember years ago in another church when they handed out the fourth grade Bibles, they didn't tell the children, but they put a $10 bill in every one of them to see if they would ever find it, which meant they had to open the Bible, and some of them didn't find it until 10 years later. So, no, there's no $10 bill in yours, but we do hope you will open your Bible and use it a lot. Listen now for the Word of God from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Hear these words today. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. I think of this passage when I think of Cindy Coulter going on to be with God or any loved one or friend that you have in mind. It's one of my favorite passages in Scripture. It has almost a rabbinic feel to it. Paul says, We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. The third passage is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And I know the young people are looking these up so they can follow. Uh, let me tell you a little trick about these four letters that are sometimes hard to remember, and they're little and they're short. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Just think General Electric Power Company, and you'll get it. <laughs> you'll never forget it now. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. This is a famous passage. It includes what's called the Christ Hymn, which is in verses 5 through 11, that probably represent a hymn that was used in the liturgies of the early church. And so this is a very, very old passage. Listen now to chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. That's the verb that's used in the NRSV. It's a very strong Greek word that means grasped or held onto, like staying in heaven. 
but emptied himself, and that's the great kenosis word, the kenotic word of completely emptying yourself, taking on the form of a doulos, a servant, a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name and so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have also obeyed me, not only in my presence, but also much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Listen to this line. Do all things without murmuring and arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you must also be glad and rejoice with me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul asks us today to be of the same mind. Wow, that's hard. It's almost impossible to be of the same mind, especially in politics and religion. Lord, our families can't even be of the same mind on where we're going to dinner and we fight over our football rivalries and sometimes spouses vote on opposite sides of the political parties. What is Paul talking about? How could we possibly ever be of the same mind? Does Paul realize what he's asking us? Well, of course he does. There was hardly a church that he started that didn't have some controversy in some way or another. So, in 1 Corinthians, in the passage he shared with us just a few moments ago, he says, I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you be in agreement, that there should be no divisions among you, and that you should be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. How can we possibly do that? It's a lofty aspiration, but there is no way we can do that on our own. I remember when I was on the faculty at Union Seminary in Virginia years ago, and we went to one service, a gathering where there was a visiting lecture from another school, and he got up there and talked about how we all need to come together, and he appealed to our common humanity to get together. And my immediate thought as I listened to the message was, that will never happen. It will never work because of our inherent sinfulness and our ability to be out for ourselves but not listen to others. We cannot just appeal to our common humanity ever to get together. Only in Jesus Christ could we ever be of the same mind. And that's why Paul says in Philippians, in the chapter 2 passage that I read, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. In all humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, look to the interests of others and be of the same mind in Christ Jesus. We can never do it on our own. 
because we will mess it up if we try. Now, as you know, if you read our e-update this week, I decided kind of at the last minute not to preach on the lectionary passage for this week, which is on the shrewdness of the unjust steward who gets fired and uh, his master tells him he needs to deal with it in some way or another. And this shrewd, unjust steward figures out a plan. He lands on his, fate, his feet with his street smarts and he executes the plan beautifully. And then Jesus praises him for it. It's a really odd passage. And I gotta tell you, I'm glad I don't have to preach that one to you today. And here's why. Thursday morning, I woke up after the vote Tuesday night on the session and after Cindy Coulter's untimely death on Wednesday morning, and I knew there was no way I could preach on this unjust steward passage. I sensed God saying, you need to speak from the heart. And that's what I need to do today. This reminds me of a class I taught at Pittsburgh Seminary called Preaching in Crisis Situations. Uh, Brian Lays reminded me he actually audited this class early in his time uh, at Pittsburgh Seminary. And the way it was set up was the reality for ministers that there are crisis things that happen. 9-11 happens, you have to scrap your sermon for Sunday and preach something else. And I remember that one, I found a passage in Isaiah that said, fear not these two towering stumps of fire. It was perfect for that Sunday. And the church was packed, as I'm sure this one was. And all churches all over the country were packed the Sunday after 9-11. Our Nielsen ratings on TV were off the chart that Sunday. Well, other things happen. Shootings in movie theaters or in schools or in churches and if it happens in your town you can't ignore that you have to say something or a prominent member of your community dies and you have to do something about it so each student created a hypothetical situation and then wrote and delivered a sermon on that as a preparation for something that might happen to them someday well that's the situation in which I find myself today. But it is neither hypothetical nor academic. It is very, very real for all of us. And it has two parts. The first is the vote that the session took last Tuesday night on membership equality and the reality of same gender marriage in our sanctuary. And the second is the death of our beloved director of children's ministry, Cindy Coulter. In both cases, we are at this moment trying to figure out how we can move on together with peace and healing and reconciliation and hope for the future. In both cases, People experienced both joy and sadness, happiness and hurt. And it depends on how you felt about the vote Tuesday night, what you're feeling this morning. Those who approved of it, and many who were sort of the subject of it, are now moving from a time of feeling excluded and put down to a feeling of joy at finally being accepted and sensing that they are accepted. But those who were against it are feeling like they were never really heard or they were silenced by the process or maybe were even put down or called a bigot or narrow-minded, which is just awful. I can't believe any of that was actually going on. So it depends on what you thought about that vote on Tuesday night, how it lands on you this morning. So that's one part of the situation in which I find myself this morning. The other is this awful death of our beloved Cindy Coulter, who lived life to the fullest. 
and we are experiencing both joy and sadness with this death, both happiness and hurt, joy as we celebrated last Friday, a wonderful life, well lived, but sadness that it was cut off way too short. And it's gonna take a long time for her daughters, Lakin and Cammy, and other family members and those who worked most closely with her and many family and friends around the country to get over this as if you ever get over a death of someone you really loved and cared for. I called her a week ago yesterday for her birthday. Uh, often have to leave voicemails, but she answered on her cell phone and her voice was very husky. She was getting nearer the end. We had a great visit. I said to her what I say to all of you, and even the little one and two year olds, I just wanted you to know I'm glad you were born. And she said, thank you, I am too. And I want to thank you for your service at IPC and being such a good colleague and friend. And she said, I want to thank you too. And I said, you know, we're going to miss you. She said, I know. I'll miss you all too. That was the last time I talked to her. So, in the context of these two events, I want to make three candid reflections to you today from the heart. The first one is churches go through hard times. That's just a fact. And when they do, eventually God does something good with it, but you can't see it while you're going through it. Churches have disagreements over crucial matters of their life together, their ministry, and their mission to the world. It is just a fact. It happened in Paul's church. It happened in the early church. It happened in the Middle Ages. It happened during the Reformation. It happened in the early part of this country's history and the Puritans up in the Northeast. It happens today. There is no way to avoid it. And the reality is we have to live through our disagreements responsibly and maturely. Disagreements over Bible and theology caused our founding pastor, Henry Edmonds, to lead a group of members out of South Highland Presbyterian Church years, over a hundred years ago, across the street to Temple Emmanuel, and eventually to this location. It is part of a church's life sometimes to have disagreements. And I've seen it my whole ministry. One of the things I've observed from the moment I was ordained in the summer of 1973 is that there are some things on which we will never agree. It's just a fact. We can talk about them for years, for months, for decades, and we will never come to complete agreement on them. But that doesn't mean we have to separate. There is a wide diversity of voices around this table. In a, in a couple of weeks we will celebrate World Communion Sunday and the table will extend to the whole world. And there is room for every single person, right, left, doesn't matter. Look at the Last Supper. Here is Jesus with all of these knucklehead disciples, with all their different opinions about everything. Peter, driving everybody crazy, always pronouncements about this and that. Ends up denying, you know, Christ in, in, toward the end. And, but then he professes Christ. I mean, what to do with Peter? He drove the other disciples crazy. You got James and John jockeying for a place at Jesus' right hand. You got Matthew, the tax collector, who had to have been a religious and political conservative. And, uh, and right next to him is Judas, a zealot, a radical liberal. And Jesus has them all. How could they possibly be together, this odd group? It's because they were all there. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, the psalmist says it well in the passage Brian read, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. We're never going to completely agree on some things. It's just a fact. You who were here in 2006 will remember that the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA met right here in Birmingham. I was brand new as president of Pittsburgh Seminary, and I came just as all presidents of Presbyterian Seminaries come. There are 10 of them to the General Assembly. I remember we all stayed at the Tutwiler downtown and we walked back and forth to the convention center for the meetings. And they were contentious as many General Assemblies are. No real big votes had been taken at that point, but they were moving that direction. And a month later in July, leadership of the church and our denomination invited all the presidents and all the former moderators of the General Assembly to come to Montreat for a big conference in Anderson Auditorium and ask each of us to get up and make some remarks. I want to share with you what I said that day. I said, you know, I'm a consensus builder and I have friends in the evangelical conservative side and I'm a little bit evangelical myself and I have friends on the liberal progressive side and I'm a little bit that self so I'm very much into social justice and I think Jesus was into both. They were just two sides of the same coin and I have tried my whole life to figure out how to bring everybody together and I have failed. I realized that it's impossible for me to do that. So I have two images I want to share with you, I said in Anderson Auditorium. One is, I imagine how God is looking at us as we argue and fight over these things. And I imagine God on a spectrum from one side to the other. And at one end is the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And God is just sobbing at how we are treating each other. And at the other end is uh, Psalm 2, the one who sits in the heavens laughs. And some days God's just cracking up at how we're, and from day to day in eternity, I don't know where God is, but God is either laughing or crying at how we are treating one another. And the other image is this. If you take the long view of church history, you will know there have been many more much more difficult times and controversies than this. In the early church, when they dealt with all of the heretics, the Manichaeans, the Donatists, the Pelagians, the Marcionites, the Ebionites, and had to deal with all of them, and they had to hammer out the Apostles' Creed, and they had to hammer out the Nicene Creed, and they fought over it over and over again. And then you go into the Middle Ages and the Crusades and the Inquisition and there was actually blood on the ground because of their fights. And you go to the Reformation and there were all kinds of fights. You can find fights in the Church of Scotland. It's, it's part of our tradition as religious people to fight with one another. And yet, what I realized, I mean, where two or three are gathered in name of Christ, there's bound to be an argument is one of the way that people put it. But what I finally realized, I said to the group in Anderson Auditorium, was this. Every time human beings tried to fix it, we always messed it up. But if you take the long view of church history, God eventually came along and solved whatever the problem was. So I have stopped worrying about it because I actually trust in God who is sovereign over all nature and history. That's the first point. The second one is Christ is our model because Christ did not account equality with God as a thing to be grasped or held on to, but emptied himself in the great canonic motif being obedient unto death, even death of the cross. At our gathering of elders for prayer before the meeting last Tuesday night, I asked the elders who were there, what do you want to pray for tonight? What do you think we should pray for before we go into this meeting? 
and different ones offered different ideas. Ellen Williams said, I want to pray that we empty ourselves today, that we open ourselves to God speaking to each and every one of us. And that is the right thing for all of us at a time like this. Cindy Coulter taught us how to empty ourselves. A humbler, nicer, sweeter person I don't think I've ever known. There was not a negative bone in her body. And every time someone would get in her face angry about this or that, she would listen and disarm them with a smile that would light up the world. Cindy taught us how to empty ourselves of whatever rancor or disappointment or anger we are feeling. And of course, she learned it from Jesus Christ, the ultimate model. I was talking with a leader of one of the major institutions here in Birmingham about what was going on a couple of months ago. And he said something very interesting to me I'd never really thought about. He said, I had something going on like that, a different subject, a lot of people quarreling, and I finally just stopped and looked at the people in my institution, and I said, look, I don't care if you're mad at me, I just don't want you to be mad at each other. I said, that's a great line. And I used it with the session back in the middle of August, and I'll use it again with you today. I know some people are mad. I don't care if you're mad at me. I just don't want you to be mad at each other. And I said to that leader of our major institution here in Birmingham, I said, you know who said that first? He said, who? I said, Jesus. He said, I don't care if you're mad at me. I just don't want you to be mad at each other. In fact, I'll tell you what, said Jesus, I'll just take all your anger upon me and I'll take it to the cross so that you'll stop being mad at each other. You know, part of this emptying yourself is getting out of the way. It's kind of getting over yourself, you know? Some of us just need to get over ourselves. So I was talking with Jane a couple of months ago, and I said, oh my gosh, I can't believe all of this that's going on. I mean, all I did was reopen the question last fall that the session said eventually we need to talk about again. I've never been pushing it, even though people think I'm pushing it. I mean, I, I, I said to Jane, I said, why did I do this to myself in my last year here? And you know what Jane said? She said, hey, Bill, it's not all about you. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> wait, wait a minute, I thought it was all about... She said, it's about the kingdom. It's about God and what God's trying to do here. Jane always writes some of my sermons. You all know that. I mean, it's just a fact. And guess what? You know what? It's not about you or you or you or you or any one of us. And it definitely isn't about me. It's about Christ wanting us to come together. So that's my final point, and I want to make it come together. You and I need to come together now with peace and healing and reconciliation no matter what we thought about this vote. It is time. It is time to remember that we have way more to agree on than we disagree on. And in fact, we only differ on this one thing, but look at all the things we agree on and that we can celebrate. We've got to quit playing one string on the violin. We have a whole symphony that we can play together. And thanks be to God for that. It is God who is calling us to open ourselves to one another in a way we never imagined to be of the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. And God is really calling on us to clean up our act as a church. I will tell you this now. You know, I want to say to those who feel 
disenfranchised right now and may even be saying, you know, I, I, I think I need to leave. And it's not so much that I'm leaving IPC, it's that IPC left me. And I respect that. If that's the way you feel, and if you feel that way because of anything I or anyone else has said, I am sorry. I, I'm sure that some of my words are not landing very well on some people today, but I'm just sharing it with you openly and as candidly and honestly as I can. This past several months have been awful. They have been messy and uncomfortable, but you know what? That is not the end of the story any more than the crucifixion was for Jesus. God always has something more to say to us, always has something more to do with us. As the old preacher said, it may be Friday, but Sunday's coming. So, how can we be of the same mind as in Christ Jesus so that we can begin to move forward with peace and healing and reconciliation and hope? Let me spell it out for you. I got a list. And Cindy Coulter modeled this list as well as anyone I have ever known. Listen to them. First one, no more negative emails in this church. Stop them about someone or to someone. If you've got something you want to say to or about someone, meet in person, and especially meet in with someone with whom you disagree. And the third one, that's the second is meet. The third one is admit mistakes. God knows I've made plenty of them. Learn how to admit mistakes. Four, ask for forgiveness and offer it to others who have hurt you or made you mad. And five, and this may be the most important one, refocus on why we are here, which is to know Christ and to serve Him in the world. This is not going to happen overnight, this healing that I'm talking about, this peace and reconciliation. It's going to take every one of us participating. I told the day school chapel the other day that I hurt my thumb exercising it. It got caught in some exercise equipment and was, it got pinched and was bleeding and it really hurt and I was telling them about it and I, I had to call my mommy uh, who's 92 years old and she was a big help and when I said I had to call my mommy, one of the little boys started crying saying, I want my mommy. <laughs> And he wouldn't stop crying. I said, well, you're feeling my pain, but it was because he wanted his mommy. Anyway, I said, you know, it takes a long time for something like this to heal. It doesn't happen overnight. It's been over a week and I've still got a Band-Aid because it's sensitive, but I noticed yesterday the healing has begun. It's a great thing about healing, isn't it, when you hurt yourself? The healing begins immediately. And guess what? It starts from within and then moves out. That's the only way the healing's going to happen for us here at IPC is it's got to start from within your heart and mind and then move out. I want to share one final quote with you from a friend of mine who's a pastor of a large 4,000 member Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, that three years ago made the same decision that our session just made Tuesday night. That's right, a Baptist Church, 4,000 members in Dallas, Texas. The Sunday after the vote, here is part of what he said to his congregation. You might be considering this your last Sunday at our church because of your disagreement over the vote that occurred recently. And you may be wondering what those of us who are staying will feel about you once you are gone. 
Well, let me tell you right now that we will always hold you in high honor as faithful members who help build and strengthen this church during your time here. And if you're wondering whether you will be welcomed back someday, let me assure you the doors and the hearts of this church will always be open to you because our decision was about inclusion, not exclusion. And that includes you, too. George's words are important for us to hear today in how we relate to each other. And I would only add, if you decide to leave, we will miss you more than you ever know, even as we miss our beloved Cindy right now. Well, there is one thing we can agree on, isn't there? And that is God is in charge and Christ is the head of the church. Little wonder that Handel's Messiah turns. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows into the hallelujah chorus for the suffering servant has become the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And yes, my friends, he shall reign forever and ever. God bless you all.